I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. Less than three months ago, we started meeting in this room. Think about that. Some of you have become really good friends of mine in just less than three months. I mean, I didn't know you. I was talking to Tommy last week. Tommy, it's good to see you here again today, Rita. We were just talking, and he said, you know, most of the people that have, have come in the last few months, most people that are attending have only come in the last few months, so about two-thirds of you have started coming in the last few months, and that's amazing. And so what God's doing, he's taking us into more than just being friends and acquaintances. He wants us to be, to act like and be family. We say this a lot of times here at, at Aspire. Matter of fact, I've said it for um, two years now as we've really been meeting in, in small groups, that church is not an event to attend, but it's a family to belong. Church is not an event to attend, but a family to belong. You ever heard that, Rose? You ever hear me say that? All right. Jolene, you've, you've heard that. It's almost become like a mission statement, but it's not. It's kind of like a motto. It's, it's, it's kind of this overarching theme of something that we really value at this, this church that God is growing. And we value it because I believe family is on the heart of God. At the end of the day, when church is no more, there'll be a day when we, we won't go to church anymore. We'll be in heaven, and you don't, you don't get to heaven and go, okay, what time does church start? I'm not sure. I don't know if I'm going this week. I'm not quite sure if I'm going to attend this week. No, it's, it's, all, it's, it's all church. Matter of fact, there's a better name for it, family. We're all family in heaven. So we might as well just get used to each other down here. We're family. So we're going to talk about that today. And as we begin really kind of concluding lessons from the vineyard, I want you to turn to John 15, Okay. John 15, we've been talking about this for the last um, few weeks now. And if you've been coming from the very first day of Aspire, you know that we have, we have really focused on one thing, and one thing only, and that is we focused on the person of Jesus Christ. You haven't heard me talk a lot about church. You've heard me talk about Jesus. And this passage talks about Jesus and our relationship with him. I believe that it is really important for us to always focus on Jesus. If you focus on Jesus, you will begin to love the church. If you focus on the church, you can miss Jesus Christ. You can. If you focus on the church, you can miss Jesus. You say, well, how is that possible? A lot of times when you go to church, Jesus isn't mentioned very much. And it's easy to do that. Now, I hope we never become that. We won't become that as long as I'm here. As long as I'm your pastor, we're going to talk about Jesus. Because I think that if you focus on Jesus and seek him, church will, will follow. But today, we're going to focus on what I believe is vital to really be the kind of family and the kind of church that he wants. Before we do that, I want to review. What is the fruit in the life of a believer. What is the fruit in the life of a believer? If you read John 15, it talks about fruit over and over again. It's the defining mark of what a believer really is. So what is the fruit that this passage mentions? It is the life of Jesus in me being lived through me. It's the life of Jesus in me being lived through me. Explain this in another way. If you have an apple tree in your yard, what does that apple tree produce? I hope so. It'd be kind of weird if it didn't, right? You wake up one morning and there's a lemon on there, there's something wrong, right? If you are a Jesus follower, what should come out? If you are this, this tree and you are the branches, what should come out of that tree if you're a Jesus follower? Jesus. If something else comes out, that's weird. 
is you look back on your week, did a lot of Jesus come out? Or did a lot of you come out? It's very simple. So Jesus is saying here, apart from me, you can do nothing. But in me, you can do all things. In me, you can do all things because Jesus can do all things. Fruit is the life of the vine being pressed out through the branches. So Jesus didn't save me so that I could live for him. He saved me so that he could live his life through me. Let me say that again. Jesus did not save me so that I could live for him. Now that sounds almost heretical, doesn't it? Jesus did not save you so you could live for him. You put that on a t-shirt there, Grant. How's that? Huh? You may that, that may not sound very popular on the football field, but make sure you put on the back this last part. He saved me so that he could live through me. He saved me so that he could live through me. When you give your life to Jesus, what you do is you die to your old life and you give your life to Jesus so that he can live his life through you. He is not interested in producing a new improved you. When you sinned, that first time you sinned, that was it. It's done. Anybody in this room ever sin? Life's done. It's over. You're separated from God. The only hope you have is Jesus Christ. So Jesus says, I'm going to come and I'm going to save you, but I'm not interested in being an addition to your life. I want to be your life. So this is just review. Major Ian Thomas said it this way. The Christian life is nothing less than the life which he lived then, lived now, in him, by him, in you. The Christian life is nothing less than the life which he lived then, lived now, by him, in you. Did you get that? So it's not you living. So if you say, I cannot, you're going to explain some things today, Brian. I, I'm out. I can't do it. You're right on the right track. If you can't do it, that's good. But Jesus can. So the goal is for you to relinquish your life to him so that he can do it. So what's the believer's role then? It sounds like I'm not even here to do anything. Your job is to abide. And abiding is to live in fellowship or relationship with Jesus every moment of every day. Your job is to live in relationship with Jesus, and then Jesus lives his life through you. So when you wake up tomorrow, your job is to live in relationship with Jesus. That's your job. Your job is to live in relationship with Jesus. So what does this fruit look like? Practically speaking, how does, how does this life look? If I remain in him and I allow him to live his life through me, what is that first fruit? What does it look like? The first fruit that we learned in this passage is a life of obedience. A fruitful life is a life of obedience. The second thing we learned last week is a fruitful life is a joyful life. It's not a happy life all the time. It's a joyful life. Have you ever been doing the right thing and you know God's called you to do it, yet you're not happy? I have. I have. Sometimes God will call you to do things, and it's, it's not making you feel happy. That goes completely contrary to with our culture. Our culture says, if it feels good. And Jesus says, no, no, it's about, it's, it's about doing what I call you to do. And it's not about being happy. It's about having a joy-filled life, a joyful life. And joy is a person. Joy is a person. Joy isn't some happy feeling. So we live in fellowship. It's about obedience. It's a joyful life. And as we conclude this series today, we're going to see the last evidence of fruit in the life of a believer. John 15, verse 12 through 17. Read along with me. If you have your Bible or phone, read with me. Verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I loved you. Greater love hath no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, 
he may give to you. This is this I command you, that you love one another. A fruitful life loves God's family. A fruitful life loves God's family. John 15, 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another. As you read the Bible, you look at Leviticus, there's all these laws. And then there's Moses, and, and he's given the Ten Commandments. And then the Pharisees come to Jesus and say, you know, what are, we, what are we supposed to do? And he tells them to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbors yourself. And he's quoting Deuteronomy. And then he comes to his disciples and he gathers in. And he's a few hours from going to the cross. And this is what he says. He says, come in. I want this to be very clear to you before I leave. These are my last words to you. Love one another as I have loved you. Love one another as I've loved you. A fruitful life loves God's family. I'm going to talk about two things today. And if you were really honest with yourself, these two words, love and family, may not make any sense to you because you've never been loved correctly. And in the context of family, your family's pretty messed up. So when I say love, you're like, I, I don't get it. And when I say family, you're like, I'm not quite sure I want to spend eternity with family. I'm looking forward to getting to heaven someday when it's just me and Jesus. Those two words are, we're just going to stop here today and talk about family, and we're going to talk about love. And you can go either way with this, but I want to start with this. I want to start with family. I want to start with family right now. I want to talk about family. And we see this, this, this word usage over and over in the New Testament. And I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. One another. You see different one another's all throughout the New Testament. I want you to do this with me. Those of you that, that have followed Jesus for some time, read your Bibles, you kind of know it. Those of you that, that haven't, don't know, have a clue what I'm talking about, you just stay quiet and that's good. That's a, no, no, no problem with that. If you, if you know a one another in Scripture, just go ahead and say it out loud. Anybody? One another. There you go. Very good. Very, that sounds like a memory verse you had to do one day. That's good. That's good. What else? Uh, serve one another. Very good. Another memory verse right here. What else? Any others? Encourage one another. Any others? Bear with one another. Bear one another's burdens. Good. You can't do very many of them in this room, by the way. You come to church and you read about these, all these one another's. It's like, I mean, you could do it, but it'd be a little awkward to go through all 60 of them this morning. Right? Especially that greet each other with a holy kiss. I'm not, we're not going there yet. We're, we're, we don't know each other, right? So that's kind of, you know, but it's in there. It does say that. So all these one another's in Scripture. You can't, but maybe one or two of them do in this room. So the setting of this has to be sometimes, has to be in a smaller group. So, so when Jesus is talking about this and John is writing it, he knows that his church is going to meet not only on Sundays, but he also knows that they're going to meet in house to house, smaller groups. That's why we emphasize small groups so much, because the love one another is connected to living this out in a small group. And you can begin to practice these one another's as we get to know one another. And so I encourage you to be a part of small groups. We have, we have six or seven of them going on on a regular time, regular day, a weekend. And, and so I want you to continue to do that and get involved in small groups. But the one another's are all throughout. And you see love one another over and over and over again. So what is the family of God or who is the family of God? It's the people that have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. All right? And so some of you are thinking, well, do you, do you love people that are not in the family? Absolutely. Jesus Christ spent his life loving other people too. But when you see one another, that is always describing the family of God, those that have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. The requirement, the command that Jesus gives is we must love family. So as a new church, we've got to describe what that looks like. What does it mean to be a part of this new family? Those of you that have relatives, you may spend Christmas, New Year's with them, maybe a birthday, maybe a wedding, and some of you are like, I'm out after that, that's all I want to do. 
right? Others of you, you've got a biological family that you love to be around. You just, you spend all your time with them. And sometimes you look at church as kind of a secondary thing because I already got my family. And then there's church and I'll, I'll go on Sunday an hour. There's other of you that are like, I don't feel really good about this family. And you're talking about another family. I, I'm interested in hearing more about that. But if it's like my biological family, I'm out. Because there's, there's, there's a blood relationship you have with your biological family. You know what? You have a blood relationship with the spiritual family. And it's Jesus Christ's blood that was shed for us. We are blood relatives. We are blood relatives. If you are a believer, get this. We're going to spend eternity together. Isn't that awesome? When I get to heaven, I'm going to look you up. Right after Jesus... Maybe my dad, and I've always kind of wanted to meet Billy Graham. Maybe Daniel, and I'll make my way over to you, okay? And I want to see you. I want to see you in heaven. Those of us that get to go into heaven are those that have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. And there is no distinguishing characteristic like we do sometimes here on earth. It's not like there's a, there's a Caucasian section in heaven and an African-American section in heaven and a Chinese section in heaven. We're all together. That's why I love gathering together and having different age groups, different ethnicities. It's important to do that because the more we do that here on earth, the more it's going to be comfortable when we get to heaven, we walk in. I think some people are going to walk into heaven and go, whoa, 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 I didn't expect this. This was, why are we worshiping together with them? And you can hear some music. Oh my goodness, you can hear some music you got away from down here on earth. You didn't necessarily like it, but in heaven, everything, there's no sin, so there's nothing bad about it. And you're going to be like, you know, I kind of like that. I, got, I can kind of dance, right? Those, those of you that grew up Baptist will be like, wow, I can, I can dance up here. That's good. There'll be David over there showing you how to do it, right? We get to heaven. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. So you might as well begin to, to practice the one another's here on earth. We're blood relatives. We're, as they say in the South, we're blood kin. We're kin. We're kin to one another. And it's every tongue, tribe, nation. It doesn't matter where I am. I can go into a country and I'm immediately with family because they're in this family because we have the blood of Christ that flows through us. So why? Why should we do it? Some of you are here saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to step in a little bit. I've never done that. Usually I do like a one-hour Bible study and then I do one hour on Sunday. Why should I buy into this idea that, that church is really family? Here's why. Number one. We really are family. That's why. I'm your family. This is not just a word, picture, or metaphor given. We are the family of God. We are a family. Another reason we love God's family. We show the world who Jesus really is. A watching world is watching us, and they're seeing who Jesus is. Who are these Christians? Who, is, who really is Jesus? And Jesus gives us his body, and this body is us. So there's a watching world that's looking at us, and I believe the only thing that's going to draw a watching world is love. When we show love, they can't deny that. If we come with, with, with judgment and law, they're out. But you know what? Jesus always kind of, for those who are unbelievers, he always led with love. I don't hold that sin against you. Come to me. I, I love you. If people were judgmental, he came against them. And he, Pharisees, remember the woman caught in adultery? The Pharisees were over here, and he began to write in the sand, and they left. And he, he comes up to the woman, and he says, I, hold, I don't hold that sin against you. He always is leading with love. The watching world is, is watching us to see what Jesus really looks like. Another reason why we should be family and love each other. Because we will be together forever. We might as well get started now. Fourth reason. We love one another because Jesus said so. I put that last because some of you are still remembering your parents telling you that when you're supposed to do something, and, they, and you say, why? And they say, because I told you so. You ever do that? How that, how that sit with, with you when they tell you? He didn't like it. But you know, when it comes to Jesus, he's perfect, we probably should do what he says. He says, love one another, so that's why I love one another. How do we do it? How do we love God's family? We love with the life of Jesus. 
We love with the life of Jesus. There's different words for love, and I want to talk about love for a moment. Different words for love. And I'm not going to get into all the Greek and all that. It doesn't matter to you. But there are different varying ways to love. For instance, I love hamburgers. A good hamburger, not a bad hamburger. I don't want to waste the calories on a bad hamburger. I want a really good hamburger, right? Like a Five Guys or something like In-N-Out. Oh, I like an In-N-Out burger. I have to stay away from it, but I like In-N-Out. They make it right there, and it's fresh. I love it. I love hamburgers, and I also love my wife. It's not equal. I love my life, wife more, okay? I love my wife more. Shouldn't I, right? I love football. Oh, can't wait for the NFL. Cold, can't wait. I mean, as soon as the summer, Super Bowl's over, I'm like, oh, I got to wait. I love watching me some football. I also, I also love my kids. I love my kids more than I love football. It's a different type of love. It's just different. And so we look at this different type of love, and we're going to talk about it because Jesus said these are the types of, of love. This is what I'm describing my love as. It's John 15, 13. Greater love hath no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. It's a sacrificial love. No greater love. There's no other love that compares to the love that forgets self and chooses others. The question may be, will you, will you die for your friend? That's a great question. Would you give up your life for somebody? We see this great example in the military of, of brothers and sisters sacrificing themselves in combat because when you get into the military, it is family. Your brothers and sisters, and you're, you're giving your lives for one another. This passage, though, takes it even to a deeper level than even the military. And that's, that's hard for some of you that have fought in battles. That's tough to understand. But Jesus is saying that greater love than this, that, 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 that you lay down your life for your friends. So he's talking about this physical sacrifice. Maybe a better question, though, for us is this. Because some of you would say, yeah, I'd take a bullet for somebody. I can think of somebody right now in the family of God that I would give my life for. Is there anybody like that? You'd raise your hand? You'd give your life for somebody. Anybody? Yeah, I would. Immediately, people come to mind. I'd, I'd give my life. Now, here's another question for you, and this is the one that I think is, is the biggest challenge. Will you die to yourself for the sake of someone else? Will you die to yourself, your wants and wishes, desires, and even hopes for the sake of someone else? You say, well, if you give your life for somebody, you take a bullet for somebody, wouldn't you also die to yourself for the sake of someone else? Not necessarily. That's day in, day out. That takes commitment. That takes dying to your wants and wishes, not just once, but ongoing. You see a bullet once. Then you're in heaven. But would you give your life sacrificially over and over and over for somebody? Will you die to yourself for the sake of someone else? Will you live for them today? Would you describe your love for those family that you, that you love? Would you describe that as sacrificial? Loving them the way that, that Jesus loves. When we moved, uh, right even before we moved here, we, we needed to find a place to live. We needed to find kind of where the church was going to be. Uh, Jessica and I and the family, we needed to know kind of a little bit of Tucson before we moved here. And we did our research. It, this, this is going back three years now of really trying to plan accordingly to what God would have for us. And my old track coach, Doug Holland, said, hey, if you need a place to stay, stay at our house. And so I can't tell you how many times I stayed at Doug and Janet's house, ate their food, messed up their room upstairs, you know, when they could have had other people they sacrificed. They, would have, they could have had family over, but I stayed with them. Jessica stayed with them. The kids stayed with them. That's a sacrifice, isn't it, to give up your, your house? I found in Tucson, now that I'm, I live here, people kind of guard their house. So now I look at it and I think, wow, that is, that's pretty powerful that they actually let me stay there and live there. That's just one example. Some of you this week and maybe even this month have sacrificed for somebody else. You've given money. You brought food to people. Some of you have been sick. Listen, when, when somebody's sick and you know they're, they're sick, it's nothing like just getting a text saying, hey, I don't mean to bother you, but if you look out your front door, there's some soup and some bread for you. 
That's awesome. If somebody's sick in the body and they don't have family here, no biological family, should you help? Yes or no? Absolutely. It's kind of foreign, though. We don't think about that. If somebody needs clothing, should we give them clothes? Absolutely. You say, I do that all the time. I help the homeless. Sometimes it is easier to help a homeless person that you don't have tomorrow with than to help somebody in the body that's really hurting because you have to stay with them as long as it takes to help them. We live in a city, I believe, that is much more interested in giving to a nonprofit to help them somehow rather than doing it face-to-face with the body of Christ. So we need, as a church, to be a church that not only helps people through nonprofits and helps people that are homeless, but we need to help the people in the family as well. That takes, that takes relationship, that takes time, and Jesus is saying here, that takes sacrifice. It also is unconditional. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from the, my father I have made known to you. It's unconditional. It's an unconditional type love. It is, it is a love that says I'm going to, to do whatever it takes. I'm going to give no matter what. This is a high level of love. It is the greatest form of love. It is the love that could only really truly be expressed with Jesus coming to earth and putting, up his, putting out his arms and dying on a cross for us, giving his life so that you could have life. That's unconditional love. That's what Jesus did for us. It's an unconditional love. You know, as we move out as a church, many of you have said to me, I've found my church home. This is it. God has given us a church home. We love this church. This is our home. I'm just going to tell you right now that it is so incredible to watch God bring you into this church, and I am thankful for you. And I'm thankful that God has put us together to do something incredible in this city, to see this city changed, and to see other churches like this multiplied throughout the city. But I'm going to tell you this. There will be a time when you're going to have to have unconditional love. It's not going to have to be just a feeling. It's got to be love where you say, you know what? There's some music that I don't like, but I'm going to love. There's the way that they did the room today I just didn't like, but I'm going to love. They used to meet at Sunrise Drive. Now they moved it like a half mile and I'm out. No, it's going to take love. And the reason I'm telling you this now is this. Nobody has complained. Better for a pastor to say this now than for when somebody does something wrong and then you think, oh, he's preaching at me. I'm not preaching at any of you. I've been around a long time and I know that this is going to take love to do what we're going to do. And it's going to take sacrifice and it's going to take a willful type love, which we'll get to in a moment. It's going to take sacrifice to do it. Unconditional love, where we just say, you know what? My money's your money. My time is your time. My home is your home. We're going to walk through this together. Now, for some of you, I even prayed about even, should I preach this? Because some of you are just saying, listen, I've just been coming six weeks, and now you're telling me that i got to be in this family. I'm just showing you what the Scripture says based upon family in general. And if Aspire is the place that you want to live out this love, then join it and do it, and we'll move forward, and we'll see incredible things. But if it's not, if this is not, it still doesn't change Scripture. Wherever you go, you will have to express this kind of love. Whether it be at Pantano, or Calvary, or Victory, or whatever church you go to, the same type of unconditional love will have to be expressed in that body. Hey, I'm partial. I kind of like Aspire. I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and do it here. Because I believe that Catalina Foothills needs to see this kind of love. I believe this community needs to see it. If we don't see Catalina Foothills get this kind of love toward each other, we will not be able to see this, cha- this city changed. Because the leadership structure in this city, it all starts here. If we can see this city get this type of love with the body, it'll begin to explode in, in communities all over this, this, this area of Catalina Foothills, and we'll see it change the city in Tucson. I believe that. I don't believe there'll be any other way to do it 
than what Jesus told us. Love one another as I've loved you. A great passage for this is in 1 Corinthians. It gives insight of what this love looks like. You've heard it in weddings, but it's not necessarily just a wedding passage. It's 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. This type of love, of being kind and patient, not envying or boasting. It's not arrogant or rude. It became really real to me, this type of love in the family. I had to travel to Ghana in 2016 to see it firsthand. I went to Ghana, and these, these men that were pastoring these churches, they got wind of this church called Hope Church in Las Vegas and these materials that we had, and, and they started living it out there in Ghana. And nobody told them you should just take it slow with church planning. Within six months, eight churches had emerged. Eight churches had exploded. And when I went there and I saw the churches, they were meeting under huge oak trees. We're talking 300, 350 people under an oak tree, 120 degree weather, worshiping God. Nobody told me that they, they worshiped a long time, right? They worshiped a long time. They heard that we were getting ready to plant a church here in Tucson. And they said, hey, would you, would you just meet with us and teach us a little bit about what you're doing and Share with us the calling that God has for you. What they were saying is, we want to make sure you're called to plant just like we're called. You see, these men had been ostracized and put out by their family because they were following Jesus now. And they had sacrificed. And they wanted to make sure that we were sacrificing and that we were called to do this. And so I was sharing a little bit about what we were doing here in Tucson. And honestly, this was three years ago. There wasn't, we didn't even live here yet. We began to share the vision and they began to weep. One gentleman, Philip, went and got a bowl and he brought it back, and as I began to share my calling, and I shared from Scripture, because one of them said, it's good to be called. He goes, what Scripture were, did, were you given for the calling? And I began to express what the Scripture was, Romans 15, 20. And, and then they began to share Scriptures of why they were called, why they sacrificed. And we're talking about families that lived in these huts in the bush with no roof over their heads. In one room, 12, 13 family members living there. They had sacrificed immensely for Jesus. And as they prayed for me, they began to take my shoes off, and they began to wash my feet. And yeah, I mean, I was just weeping. Another gentleman next to me, Craig Marquis, who's now on our, our financial board of Aspire, he, uh, he's sitting next to me three years ago, and he just, I had to beg him to go on the trip. And here he is, and he's getting his feet washed. And they began to speak into us words that were just powerful from God. Words of edification and lifting me up. But one gentleman spoke into me. He said, where you're going, it's going to be dry. And I'm thinking, well, Tucson is dry. And he said, spiritual dryness. It's going to be drier and it's going to be hotter than here. And at times you're going to want to quit. But there are people that are going to come to know Jesus there in Tucson because of what God's going to do through you. As they're washing my feet. It was powerful. Jeff, there's a bowl back there if you'd bring it up here. That bowl right on the table. This isn't the bowl they washed my feet in, by the way. But we use this bowl. I got it there in that community. To, just to remind me of, of, of that powerful time in Ghana. And you know, we take our offerings in this bowl. For me, it's a reminder of the sacrifice they made. Of giving their food their time, their energy, their prayers for us. In a real way, guys, Aspire Church was planted in North Ghana. I believe our church started that day when they washed my feet. And Philip and Timothy were two that washed my feet that day. That's where Aspire Church started. That's where Aspire Church started. You see, the kingdom of God begins with prayer. It doesn't begin with people. And they prayed for us, and it started there. Actually, in a real way, I couldn't take an Instagram because we're getting your feet washed. It kind of ruins the moment, right? So I'm not taking pictures, but I was on that bench. This church was started through prayer, 
And the word that was spoken was that this is going to be hard. It's going to cost, and it's going to, we're going to have to sacrifice. We're going to, it's going to be unconditional love. And you're going to have to make a willful desire, which is the last point. It is willful to love this way. Verse 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain. It is willful. When I think of this word willful, it draws me to Jesus who we will remember in just a few days, said these words in Luke twenty two forty two. 42. As he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, his fully 100% being said this, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. What's he saying there? If there be any other way, I don't want to bear this sin. I don't want to experience death. I've never done that. Fully 100% Jesus saying, I have a choice to make. I have a choice whether I'm going to go to cross for you or not. Some people, they, they, they forget the fact that Jesus wasn't forced to go. He willfully, 100% said, I choose you. That is love in its greatest extent. And Jesus said, nevertheless, what he's saying is 100%. Is there being any other way humanly? Then he says, you know what, I, I have to listen to my Father. I can do nothing apart from him. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. What does this mean to us? For some of you here today, you're hearing this story. And it's a neat story. This is a, this is a great passage. If everyone would look at me for a second, just look at me here for a second. You ready for this? Listen to this. Some of you are not in the family. Some of you aren't in the family. What's keeping you from the family of God? Is it you? You can take care of that right now. You say, well, shouldn't we do something, dim the lights more, or put some candles on? Not at all. Right now, you can cross over from your life to his life, your family into his family. You will receive an adoption right now that will be forever. He will adopt you into his family right now. A family that is different than the family that you've ever experienced. A love that is deeper and stronger than anything you've experienced. And nothing will separate you from that love. You want to be in that family? I'd say so. That's awesome. In a moment, I'm going to pray and ask you to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Here's the second group. It's those of us in the family. Okay, so the first group, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to receive Christ. The second group is this. You're in the family, yet there are some people in the family, a year, two, five, six years ago, maybe even in this room, you've done some things that you shouldn't have done. And you need to text them and say, would you forgive me? You're a family member of mine, would you forgive me? I've hurt you, would you forgive me? In a moment, I say you just... Man, just head on out and make a phone call and say, would you forgive me? You're in the family. I need to be right with you. I never thought of you being in my family like that. I've treated you bad. I haven't talked to you in years, and we left things on bad terms. I want to get, make that right with you. You can do that today as well. You see, as a father looking at it, he's like, you know what, Brian? This is what I want for you. Would you invite some people that I know right now are not believers into the family? Would you do that for me, Brian? Yeah, I'll do that. Secondly, would you speak to the family right now that is not getting along? There's some people in this room that have hurt people in the past, and I want them to make it right. Yeah. You see, that does, the, that does the father something that shows him love, that shows him honor, that shows him worship and reverence. When we do those two things. So right now, I'm going to ask you if you'd bow your head. And I'm going to ask, for those of you that aren't quite sure if you're in the family. Let's just take care of it. You say, oh, I'm not sure. I, I think I was maybe baptized as a kid. I think I was christened. I think I was, no, no, no. This is a conscious decision that you make to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. And let me ask you three things. Number one, do you, do you believe that, that you've sinned, that you've done things wrong in your heart? Number two, 
Do you believe that Jesus Christ took those sins on the cross and was resurrected? And he gives that life to you. He wants you to have that life. And number three, this separates us from Satan and the demons and everybody else that believes those, that head knowledge I just said. The third thing is this. You trust and you give your life to him. You say, Jesus, I trust you with my life. I give you my life right now. I'm going to lead you in a prayer and ask you to make that commitment right now. You can just do this in the quiet of where you are right now. You can just say this and repeat this in your heart after me. Dear Father, I believe I've sinned. I believe that you died for me on the cross. And I believe that you're alive today, that you were resurrected. Right now, I turn from my life and I trust you with my life. I give it to you right now. Would you come into my life? Would you save me? Would you change me? I pray this in your son's name. Amen. With your heads bowed, everybody just, just keep your heads bowed if you would. The quiet of this moment. Nobody looking around. I'm going to look, but nobody else look right now. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, would you just slip your hand up? Just, I want to pray for you. I won't embarrass you. Anybody here? Pray that prayer for the very first time. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else today? That's powerful. Anybody else? You prayed that prayer. You said, you know what? I prayed to enter into this family. Your Father, thank you for those that have trusted you as Savior. Nothing is greater than that. The angels in heaven rejoice, and we do too, Lord. Somebody came in here today dead, and they're leaving here alive. We praise you, Jesus. We thank you. Lord, I also pray for those that are family members that need to take a step and make a call today or clear things up with somebody. Even if they're not quite sure, they'll just say, you know what, I'm just going to go do it anyway. Just to make sure there's nothing between us, I'm just going to go to them and make it right. I pray for them. And Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do through Aspire Church. Thank you that you're going to take us from just being an event on Sunday to being a family that multiplies families, that multiplies families, that multiplies families all over this city. And we will see your kingdom come to Tucson, Arizona. And we thank you for other churches that are doing the same thing. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing taking us from thinking just about church as an event to a loving family that's on your heart all the time. Praise you and thank you. Pray this in your son's name. Amen.